All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name's Adam and I'll be your moderator. We're welcoming back Dr. David Wong for another webinar, this time covering implant treatment planning with 3D imaging. Dr. Wong is a board certified periodontist and international lecturer. At any point during the webinar, if you do have questions, please type them into the Q&A and we'll answer them live at the end. Henry Shine is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation, live or on demand. And this webinar is sponsored by Plan Mecca. Dr. Wong, you keep coming back, so everyone must love your content. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I'm surprised they haven't gotten sick of me yet, but uh, I'm sure that day will come. And, and until then, I'm going to keep talking. All right. So welcome, everybody. Today, we're going to switch it up a little bit. Uh, in the past, we've been talking a, a lot about you know surgery and things like that. And we're still going to talk about that today. But the connection or the gap I want to bridge for everybody today is is how we actually use the CBCT in action. And we're gonna go over the different ways that, that people get into CBCTs from you know, just diagnosis to treatment planning to actually implementing it into the implant you know, surgery and restorative therapy. So let's go over everything today. Um, I'm gonna to be with you guys for about you know, 45, 50 minutes and then we're gonna turn it over to some Q and A because a lot of people will have specific questions that are pertaining to their uh, specific you know workflows in their office so uh, I want to hear you guys out and see what you guys have to say there so so just like before uh, if you guys don't know who I am I'm David Wong um, I practice in Tulsa Oklahoma I'm a periodontist I do have two Instagram accounts which is how most of you guys probably came to uh, discover this webinar uh, my personal account is david.wong.eds and my surgical account which a lot of people like to follow for periodontal surgery and implant surgery and things like that is, is plaque China. So uh, feel free to follow me there. Um, but what we would want to talk about, and, and uh, like Adam just said, this, this talk is being sponsored by Plan Mecca. It's actually the machine that I've been using uh, for over, gosh, over 15 years. I've been using the Plan Mecca Pro Max. And, and what I love about it is that thing is durable. Um, I have not had a different machine. We've had upgrades and things like that. But it's a fantastic machine. As you can see here, we do a lot of different things with it, uh, ranging from single tooth dentistry, which is you know my personal uh, specialty, all the way to full arch things, which we do plenty of as well. But no matter what I love about it is, is that no matter where you are with your CBCT training or your dental implant training, there's just something for everybody, for all different experience levels. And that's what we're going to walk through today. Is all, is all the different things that you can do with it. Uh, you can just use it for, like I said, you can just use it to show patients uh, what their basic anatomy is. Um, you can show them um, uh, what their wax up is going to look like. You can work out occlusion nowadays. It's, it's really crazy what you can do with these things. So um, with that being said, what CBCT does for us all, you know, whether or not we're working with a digital workflow or doing a little bit of analog, which I'm going to show you today as well, because I don't want to give you guys the impression that all I do is digital dentistry and digital surgery. Uh, I'm going to show you some analog things too, too, as well, because, you know, it's really important that we have, you know, technology and tools, but it's also really important to understand that sometimes these things do break down. Sometimes your Wi-Fi goes out or sometimes your internet connection or whatever, uh, goes out or your machine goes out and it kind of messes up your whole digital workflow. It's important sometimes to know, you know how to do things by hand as well. So we're going to talk about that. My main purpose today is going to be related to dental implant surgery. Um, as a periodontist, I get a lot of these types of cases, you know, where we have exposed abutments or recession on dental implants uh, misplaced implants, malpo malpositioned implants, like we call them. Um, we have failing implants, but these are all things that, that amount to things that in my view could be very, very preventable if we not only had the right technology, but if we also knew how to implement that technology. Um, you know, these machines and things don't do you any good if you don't know how to use them properly. So my goal today is to make sure you don't mess up, okay? Um, at the very least, we have to understand in dental implant therapy that we do have failures, okay? And we do have incomplete results and we have to do revisions and do-overs and things like that. But those are things that, you know, that happen, right? 
I don't want things in your office or my office to happen because we did an incomplete job or a poor job uh, and, and just didn't you know, do our homework ahead of time and weren't diligent. So let's go ahead and get started with the common uses of CBCT. Very, very, uh, there's a whole lot of different ways to use it, but at the very beginning, you know, at the very least, we're gonna use the CBCT for show, right? We're gonna use it for a show and tell for patients. It's a different type of an image compared to a panoramic uh, radiograph or PAs or bite wings and things like that. So at the very least, we're gonna use it for show. Um, eventually, we wanna, we wanna graduate from that and, and at least learn how to read them basically uh, to evaluate the bone for implants, which will lead us into how to plan uh, the, restore, the restorative side of it to help our surgeons uh, you know, tell, to help, help them uh, understand where we want the implant placed and why. Um, maybe you do your own implant surgery. You know, maybe you're a periodontist or an oral surgeon watching, or maybe you're a restorative dentist that does their own implants as well. But maybe you want to graduate from there and, and get into surgical guide fabrication or even you know, surgical guide fabrication, implant placement, and immediate provisionalization, you know. Um, we also use CBCTs to evaluate our results post-operatively, or maybe we inherit a case and we use a CBCT to evaluate other people's results so that we know where to go from there. And finally, where things are going, which I won't have a whole lot of time to cover today, is going to be implant-related regenerative procedures. We're now using uh, CBCTs to help with our bone grafting. As an example, you know, you'll see these things where we're making surgical guides uh, to, to allow us to accurately harvest, uh, harvest bone like ramus grafts and chin grafts and things like that. We're using surgical guides generated from the CBCT to carry out these procedures as well, which is pretty cool. So the evolution of CBCT in action for you, uh, like I said, Depending on your experience level, most of us at the very entry level will use the CBCT for show, okay? And then as we get going with it and learning how to manipulate the software and understanding what we're looking at, we eventually start looking at the bone and then we start looking at the process, the, the prosthesis design. We started getting into making surgical guides uh, with or without uh, the help of a, of a lab. Some people do their own. Uh, we'll get into prosthesis, uh, design and fabrication, evaluate results, and finally, when you get really advanced, you'll start using these things to help you with things like, um, you know, block grafting or even sinus grafts, which I'll show you here in a bit. Uh, real quick, because I don't have a whole lot of time to explain the difference between a, how a cone beam uh, CT works compared to a traditional CT. I'm going to refer you to this article. It's on the internet. Very, very easy read, actually. Uh, believe it or not, really describes how uh, cone beams work. So I would recommend uh, this as, as part of your reading if you're interested. So, you know, using the CBCT for show. If you're new to it, you're going to want to play around with the images because you're going to see a lot of different filters and things that you can do. Um, that you can use to wow your patients, which, you know, that's not why you buy these things. It's an, an expensive investment if that's all you're using it for. But at the very least, that's what you do. And I'm going to show you an example uh, of something here. So this is this is a, a friend of a friend. And, and for years, you know, his his uh, hygienist has been showing him this periapical film of this gigantic abscess he has on this lateral incisor. And because he, he's asymptomatic, he has really he hasn't done anything about it. Right. Just not really interested. This type of x-ray is what we normally show patients and it means like nothing to them, right? But when we take a CBCT of this area, now all of a sudden he can see his skeleton and his teeth. And he's like, wow, look at that big hole, you know, that's, that's going through my upper jaw. What is that all about? Well, that's coming from your tooth and you need the tooth extracted. So for him, you know, even though the CBCT really is of no value except for you know, the, the show and tell value of it, it's, it really helps to, to help, a, it helps a patient see the actual problem and maybe convinces them just a little bit more to move that needle towards, towards moving forward with treatment. So that's the show part. 
Um, if we're doing implant treatment planning, it's just really neat. You know, patients love seeing these things because, you know, otherwise they, you're showing them a periapical film or a panorex, and it's really hard to show them, especially in the anterior region where our panos tend to have the most, you know, distortion. It really is nice to have a tool like this to show them where you're going to put the implant or where their surgeon's going to put the implant. A really neat way for them to visualize what you want to do. Of course, with CBCT, we also need to, you know, understand where the critical anatomy is, such as where the mandibular canal is. Uh, we don't want to hit any nerves. So this is a, a way to explain to patients, you know, what our safety zone is, you know, how we're going to do the surgery safely without hurting them, because that's what they all want to know too, is, is they have some fear of surgery. And, and this kind of helps to put their mind at ease that we've got everything under control. We're doing everything that we can to make sure that, that uh, we uh, are you know, foreseeing any you know, potential complications and things like that. If we're doing sinus surgeries, it's really neat to be able to see you know, other crucial anatomic structures, you know, such as the size and shape and morphology of the sinus cavity. Also things like the intraosseous branch of the, of the uh, posterior, severe, posterior superior alveolar artery uh, that you can see here with arrows pointing. It just helps us plan out our surgeries so that you know, not only can we inform our patients of you know, potential bleeding issues like this, but also lets us know, for example, you know, how, how deep we're going to have to drill before we you know, get to the uh, Schneiderian membrane or how much bone we're probably going to need. Um, it just gives us a lot of information so that we can plan our surgeries accordingly and, and inform our patients properly. Um, this is a case, you know, th this guy just came in last week, actually. You know, so he comes in uh, with his implant. He says the gum is sore around his implant. You know, at first glance, when you look at the facial and the lingual, you can see that things aren't perfect. But when you look at the periapical film, everything actually looks okay. You know, it doesn't look terrible. But when you take a CBCT and look at the sagittal view, you can really see why the, this gentleman is, is uncomfortable on the lingual side. There's no bone there. You know, the, the surgeon uh, who put the implant uh, in just totally perforated and obliterated the lingual plate. And now that tissue is sore. So without a CBCT, this is the information that we have. We don't really know uh, the nature of the, of the implant position. Really, we, we can kind of guess, but we don't have confirmation until we can take the CBCT. So it's really nice to at least at the very uh, rudimentary level uh, get to this point where we know how to, to know what we're looking at. So you don't even have to be a surgeon to see some of these issues. Um, after we get you know, past the show and tell and the diagnosis part of things, it's really nice to be able to uh, show the patient you know, as an initial uh, implant screening appointment to be able to evaluate the bone for implants. So this is an old, old, old software. As a matter of fact, this is the very first software that I used back in uh, 2003, 2004. Um, this is, this was, um, as you can tell from the graphics, it's nothing sophisticated. But back then, to be honest, I didn't use the CBCT to its full capabilities. I, I did what most of you all do. I just put the implant in, typed in a few, you know, the diameter and the length, and just, I just wanted to see if the implant would fit. You know, and that's really all I used the CBCT for, which was just to evaluate the bone um, for adequate, uh, adequate dimensions for an implant. Nowadays, uh, if we're not doing guided surgeries and things like that, a lot of surgeons will take a CBCT of the, the dental of the tooth before we take it out to see if they're a candidate for a immediate implant. So what they're looking for is the labial plate, the presence or absence of it so that they can plan accordingly. So that's another use of CBCT when it comes to the treatment planning aspect. Um, CBCTs are also nice for visualizing things like fractures, that you, uh, root fractures that you don't see necessarily on, on uh, periapical films. So this is just another nice thing for us to be able to see. Also, you can see you know, where the labial plate is, you know, how much bone there is, you know, to the, to the lingual side of that tooth so that we can plan accordingly with how to replace that tooth uh, with an implant or otherwise. Um, right before you do surgical guides and things like that, you know, we plan everything out. Patients always want to know, you know, before we get started. And I'm, 
we're going to end this talk today with me walking you through an entire case from start to finish and how I use the CBCT and how I talk to patients and communicate with my restorative dentist as well as the lab on, on replacing a single tooth because that's where I live and breathe every day is single tooth replacement. So once again, um, at the very, very least, when you first get a hold of your CBCT, you're at the very least going to want to know how to manipulate the software, know basic anat anatomical structures like the mandibular canal, the anatomy of the sinus, where it's at, and of course, how to, how to just use your software to, to place an implant virtually to show, to show the uh, patient where your, their implant's going to go. Um, beyond planning out or beyond seeing if the patient has enough bone for an implant, one of the other things that we like to do is, is we can actually you know, put the teeth into the software. And what we're doing here is you can actually superimpose uh, just the, either a cast model or a digital impression, which or whichever you like. You can actually superimpose the two uh, on top of each other so that you can show the patient a, a rough wax up of what their implants are probably going to look like you know, once you're done. And I want to show you how accurate this can be because we can actually show the other benefit of, of surgical guides is, is the benefit of minimally invasive surgery. But the whole point of me showing you this is that you can actually show the patient how what their teeth are going to look like. I'm going to go backwards here. You can show them what their teeth are going to look like compared to the real deal. And it actually comes out you know, pretty close a lot of the times. When it comes to full arch restoration, some of you all are, are into that as well. I won't talk too much about full arches today because I really want to get to the, to the meat and potatoes of, of single tooth replacement. Um, but there's going to be some things with full arch that you absolutely have to have a CBCT for. Because when it comes to full arches, there's a few things that we know about implants. Um, you know, number one, you know, the surgeon is going to want to put the implant where the bone is. But number two, the restorative dentist, um, Sometimes is it's the the surgical treatment plan and the restorative treatment plan. Sometimes they don't they don't gel. Okay, it's hard to reconcile that. So this is an example here where you know my restorative dentist, uh, Dr. Joe Massad, he, he's he's outlined six implants for me where they where he, where he wants the implants, but where they actually come in out of the bone, it's actually way to the lingual, which is way different than you know where I would have placed them if I was just eyeballing it or if I was doing the plan by myself you know a surgeon's perspective we're going to want to put the implants in the middle of the bone I mean that's that's where we would put it or even slightly to the lingual uh, whereas uh, somebody like uh, Dr. Joe Massad uh, when we were writing this, this uh, article it's called um, introspective uh, introspectively uh, driven implant uh, surgery when we're writing this stuff, it's, it's interesting because, you know, sometimes my surgical, my surgical plan, a lot of times my surgical, surgical plan and his restorative plan uh, can be off. And, and, you know, when that situation arises, I always say that the restorative dentist always wins. Um, sometimes it can't be because it's not safe that way, but I'd say the majority of the time, I'd say the restorative dentist wins. So we will augment or do whatever we need to do to make sure that we get the implants in the proper position. This is really uh, important, especially when we talk about full arch cases, because a lot of the times, whether we're talking about an implant overdenture or a fixed, uh, fixed bridge or hybrid, whatever you want to call that, it's really important that patients not only have stable implants, but they have to be able to function comfortably uh, with their prosthesis. And sometimes we can't do that if there, our implants aren't in the position that our restorative dentist wants them to be. A CBCT helps us to reconcile our differences uh, between me and my restorative dentist. So, so it, sometimes I always joke that expectation and, and reality are two different things when it comes to full arch. On top, you can see where uh, Dr. Massad has has planned the implants for me. And then on the bottom, you can see where the actual implants went in with the surgical guide, way different, completely different, but it's where he wanted. Surgical guides, uh, this is probably where we get the most questions 
Um, I love surgical guides. They make my life a whole lot easier as a periodontist because what I do a lot of times is we'll grow the bone and the soft tissue um, all it, it beforehand. That way, by the time it comes time to implant placement, all I have to do is make a surgical guide uh, like you see here. And I can even put in extra holes just in case I'm between sites. And, I'm, you know, I want to pick the better of the two sites, uh, like you can see here in the number, you know, 11, 12 area. But it's really nice to be able to do these types of surgeries because, you know, once the, if you're working with a specialist like me, it's nice because we can get the ridge all set up for you. Uh, to where all you have to do is make a surgical guide and you literally just put this, the uh, surgical guide sleeve in and just drill straight through uh, straight through the guide, through the tissue. And that's, and that's how you prepare your implants. So it's, it can be re really this easy. As, as you can see here, the, you just drill straight, uh, straight through the guide. You, hub, you know, take the drill all the way to the hub till you can't go anymore. And that's, that's how you drill out four implants. Um, in a situation like this, you know, the patient was going to have six implants. So all you do is you move the bite block to the other side and, and finish out the other two. So it's, it can be that simple, um, just like, like you see here with proper planning. So there's his final, final um, prosthesis. Eventually, though, um, you know, what you want to do, too, is is patients don't always want to, to be in an, an immediate denture. So when we talk about full arch stuff, the other uh, situation you want to get, you'll find yourselves in eventually is patients who want immediate load, or you'll want to do that too, because, you know, sometimes working around an immediate denture and doing all the adjustments and, and trying to work around your, your uh, healing abutments and things like that, it can be kind of a drag. So, you know, when the situation arises, when you can do immediate load, it's really nice to be able to use a CBCT uh, to not only place and plan, plan and place your implants, but you can actually plan the prosthesis at the same time too, and have that already prefabricated. That way it's ready for you at the time of surgery. Um, finally, you know, when you're done with your implants, we use CBCT and this is where we get into a debate sometimes about radiation and, and what's ethical for patients. But a lot of times, you know, we will use a CBCT to check our results, to make sure that we place the implant where we said that we were gonna place it. And we want to make sure that we avoided things that we wanted to avoid. Like in a situation like this, I wanted to place the implant to the palatal side to where we had a screw retained crown, but I also wanted to miss the incisive canal, which we did. So this is the way I, I like to check myself sometimes. Um, with full arch cases, I do this all the time as well. I'll take a CBCT just to make sure that you know, I didn't perforate the sinus, you know, on accident or something like that. Or I'll use it to monitor, you know, my ridge augmentations to make sure that, you know, I place the implants in, within bone and didn't drift off to the labial uh, side, uh, which which can happen as well. And then finally, we'll talk about implant-related uh, regenerative uh, procedures. So CBCT in action. So this is a case uh, that you guys may have seen before. I didn't really talk too much about the CBCT side of it, but I'll tell you this. Um, I have not always used surgical guides. You know, I've, I've always, you know, whenever I first got my CBCT, just like most of you, I simply would take a, you know, some clinical photos and I would look at the, at the tooth. In this situation, we're going to be uh, taking out tooth number nine. I'd take a PA and then I'd take a CBCT just to look at the labial plate, right? And if the labial plate was there, then I would, I would tell the patient, I'm gonna do an immediate implant. If the labial plate isn't there, then I would you know, augment the ridge first. So that would be the extent of my use of a CBCT was just to, to evaluate uh, the anatomy and see if there was enough bone for an implant. So in a situation like this, you know, I would just go ahead and take out the tooth and then remove the crown from the tooth and use it as my provisional. But this is all done here, you know, using, you know, just what we call brain guided surgery. I'm just using my, my, uh, my, my training with no other, with uh, no other help uh, to place the implant. Now I know from my, you know, being a periodontist, I know where I want the implant and I know, you know, roughly where my restorative dentist is going to want the implant, 
but I'm not using a guide at this point. I'm just using my brain, right? Which is what a lot of you all do. And then we'll add the soft tissue and all this other stuff. But ultimately, this is how I return my patient, you know, to the, to the restorative dentist. We use the CBCT in, in, the, in the earliest sense only to evaluate the bone and to see if there's enough bone for an implant. And that's how I operated for many, many years, actually, until probably until about seven years ago. This is solely how I operated uh, with the CBCT. I would put the patient in a provisional for a period of time. If you guys want to know how this case went about, look up my Henry Shine webinar on digital technology. I walk you through all of that stuff here, but this is the final result using the CBCT and just um, and just no surgical guide uh, is, is used in this situation. Now, if we're talking about more complicated scenarios, and this is a case that I wanna walk through a little bit more, you guys have seen some of this before, but I wanna walk and dive into this a little bit more because the CBCT as a periodontist or a pay for, or for a patient who needs other you know, uh, additional surgeries related to an implant, CBCT is key because the key to, to handling anterior implant aesthetics is going to be minimally invasive surgery. And in a situation like this, we have tooth number nine that has a horizontal root fracture, and there's also a large periodontal uh, vertical defect on the mesial aspect of it. And you'll also notice on the other side, on the, dis the, the distal side of number nine, there is horizontal bone loss between number nine and number 10. Now, this is where it gets kind of fun because we get to start to, um, to, to plan our surgery with the end in mind, with the prosthesis in mind. So this is how we're going to design this. So the challenges of this case is that there's a horizontal root fracture, perio defect, there's a periapical radiolucency, and we have poor interproximal bone height. I don't like any of that stuff. So from a clinical perspective, and I'm going to repeat this because if anything, you guys are going to get some information about how I use CBCTs, but I'm also going to give you some, some clinical tips on how, how, to utilize, how, to, how to use your clinical judgment with the CBCT to come up with a treatment plan. So when you look at a, a morphology like this, long tapered teeth always scare me because I know that they're also going to have real tall, skinny papilla. And long, long, tall, skinny papilla are really, really difficult uh, because they're not stable. They're not stable pieces of tissue and they tend to go away. And we have to worry about that. Um, this patient al already has a black triangle. So, you know, it's rare that black triangles ever get smaller. They always either stay the same or get bigger. So we have to manage that as well. One thing I want to share with you as well is going to be uh, something about aesthetics is going to be that when people smile 87 to 100 percent of the time, the tips of their papilla are visible. Um, this is a little different than what we used to call a high smile line where the lip, uh, the lip height was, was solely based on the zenith of the gingival margins of the central incisors. Under the old rule, we would call this patient, uh, this patient smile a low smile line, but, but being how prominent the papilla are, we're, we're going to call this a high smile line. So just like with anything else, we're going to have it with, with any hopeless tooth, we're going to start off with as atraumatic an extraction as possible. And you'll immediately see how unstable that papilla is between number eight and nine. The temptation for most people at this point is going to be to place an implant. And I'm going to share with you why I chose not to here in a bit. I chose to place a socket graft along with a hybrid hard and soft tissue graft, utilizing the tuberosity as my, as my donor site. And this is called a socket seal. And with a socket seal, half of your graft is bone and the other half is actually soft tissue because it comes from the maxillary tuberosity. I utilize that to seal off. That's why it's called a modified socket seal technique. It seals off the socket and that's gonna be your hard and soft tissue. Now, where your CBCT comes into play, and this is why I love um, this particular slide, 
is one concept with all anterior implant aesthetics is the three, two rule. Now this is coined by Dr. Lyndon Cooper, who's at the University of Illinois in Chicago, really, really well-known prosthodont, well, well-known and respected prosthodontist, good friend as well. But what the three, two rule is, is because it's really important because if we just use our old, our old common sense or our, our old dental school training, we'll just put the implant in line with all the other teeth, which would make sense. The problem with, with that is it with implant aesthetics and how uh, sockets, uh, how sockets heal, we don't do that, you know, and also how implants heal as over time, we don't do that either. So we, we follow this rule called the three, two rule. And this is where the CBCT comes into play. What the three, two rule is, is, is where we place an implant in a vertical posi position that's three millimeters apical to the free gingival margins of the adjacent teeth. And the two millimeter part of it is that we place the, the implant two millimeters to the lingual of the facial plate, or in other words, we want the implant emerging from the cingulum of the final restoration. The reason for that is number one, it takes into account any uh, atrophy that, that occurs uh, as implants are placed and as we remodel because the majority of implants do recede about one millimeter within the first year of function. Number two, it also leaves you know, more bone to minimize that recession. Uh, but number three, it also gives us an opportunity for a screw retained restoration. So that's the three, two rule. And we can only visualize that really with the CBCT as you can see here. Looking at the top of your screen where the implant's placed, you know, how many of us would actually you know, place an implant that way? You probably wouldn't, at least not by, you know, not, not, not eyeballing it. So a surgical guide is made. And what I love about surgical guides in this situation, because we did that modified socket seal surgery, we can actually place that implant through the guide totally flaplessly. So flapless surgery. And when we do this, patients hardly had any pain. As a matter of fact, the implant surgery itself only takes about 10 minutes. Uh, it goes by really, really fast. But at this, at this point, we can see that the periodontal defect has been filled with the socket seal surgery. We can get a provisional restoration on it. Now here's where science comes into play. Notice how that unstable papilla has disappeared even with flapless surgery and even with the presence of a provisional restoration. Is that something that we should worry about? Absolutely, we should worry about that because once again, the papillas show 87 to 100% of the time uh, when people smile. So you can see that even though she has a low smile line, you can see that, that everybody can see that the papilla is missing. However, the good news is that the papilla also increases in height, 0.375 millimeters after one year, and it can get even more after that. So this is the final restoration at two years. And as you can see here, as we go from pre-op to four months where the papilla is missing to the two year mark, you can clearly see uh, how the, the two year uh, versus the pre-op, they look virtually identical as far as the soft tissue goes. So. That's where the CBCT and you know, implant, um, the science of implants kind of come into play to give this patient a really good result. Now, going back to the question, could an implant have been placed immediately? Well, the answer of course depends on your plan. So when I, whenever I worked up her plan, this was her, this was her first plan that I, that I worked up. It called for taking out the tooth and placing an implant in the middle of the bone slightly to the lingual. But no matter how lingual I got it, the implant was going to emerge out the facial of the initial, uh, of the initial tooth setup. That would mean that we would either have to use an angled abutment or you know, we would just have to have a cement retained uh, restoration. At the time we didn't have, um, angle screw access or angle screw channels. So that wasn't a possibility at the time. So I didn't want that. Uh, I didn't think that that's something that I would want for my patient, uh, me. So I didn't want that for my patient either. On the other hand, whenever I did uh, place the implant where it came out the cingulum, then we thinned out the facial plate. And I didn't want to do that either because I would be inclined to want to graft that area, which throws out the whole idea of 
um, you know, flapless surgery and minimally invasive surgery. So we chose to graft first and then place the implant later. Um, so far, we've just been doing everything, you know, the first time we did it, an immediate implant, like I said, I did it for many, many years, which is with no guide. I just kind of, you know, did, did it the way that I was taught in residency. But nowadays, whenever we do our immediate implants, like we're doing uh, number nine here, um, nowadays, what I like to do is I'll, I'll set up a planning call uh, with my lab, which I use Vulcan Labs uh, through BioHorizons. But they actually know exactly what I want, you know, where I want the implant. Uh, I want it coming out the cingulum and we'll actually plan everything out beforehand. And which is really nice because in addition to you know, being able to take the tooth out, I'll just put the, put the uh, surgical guide on and we'll actually place the implant straight through the surgical guide. In this situation, it's really nice to be able to do that because if you guys have done immediate implants, you'll know that that sometimes your, your implant drills will want to skip around and things like that. With a guide, it's a much easier uh, to get the to get um, a firmer, more sure uh, angle of angle of uh, impact as you're preparing your osteotomy. Here we're just retrofitting his existing crown uh, because, as you can tell from from his other teeth, he has some other teeth that that we're not so sure about. So we're just going to leave him in a provisional for now. Um, and once again, with this, with this type of a, with this case, I covered this uh, material as well in the digital uh, dentistry portion uh, of, my, of our webinar with, with Henry Schein. And then um, to evaluate results, we'll just take another CBCT to make sure that, that we did what we said we were gonna do, avoided the incisive canal, left two millimeters of bone uh, to the facial like I just shared with you regarding the three, two rule. And what I like to do uh, whenever I'm doing temporaries, I'll just fill the, uh, fill the access hole with, with just impression material. Uh, some people like the Teflon tape and, and uh, or a cotton, cotton pellet and, and composite, but this, because where it's a lingual uh, access, I'll just fill it with, with um, impression material. That way I can just pick it out later uh, really quickly. The additional benefits of surgical guides, uh, going back to full arch, things like that. Um, you guys may remember whenever it comes to, to full arch cases, you have to have a minimum of, of inner arch space to account for the, the thickness of the material for the prosthesis uh, to prevent any breakage and things like that. So you need a surgical guide um, to be able to tell you how much bone to reduce Otherwise, you're just in there, you, know, you have no teeth, so you're kind of in there eyeballing how much bone to, to reduce. And of course, your patient may be sedated or asleep, and it's kind of hard to judge. Um, and the tendency is with our hands and our eyes, we, you know, we'll slope the bone a, a funny direction sometimes. So it's nice, you know, with, with CBCTs, we can fabricate these bone reduction guides to where, you know, we, we screw these things into the, the patient's jaw and then we just get our burr and we just level the bone even with the surgical guy. It's very, very simple. Um, so CBCTs, you know, without that, this part of it would number one, take forever. Uh, number two, uh, we wouldn't be nearly as accurate as we are with the surgical guide. This way we know that the, that the ridge is completely flush. There's no eyeballing it. We're not accidentally gonna slope it uh, one way or the other. So if you're doing an all on X angled implants, whatever you're doing, uh, CBCT definitely is an indispensable tool in that regard. Um, as far as implant related regenerative procedures, as we get really um, down our experience level uh, with CBCTs, you, know, you may want to experiment with dynamic guides. And what a dynamic guide is, is um, it's basically a turn by turn, you know, GPS type of guide. So, so far the, the surgical guides that I've showed you are called static guides, meaning we put, you know, the patient wears it almost like an occlusal guard. It's static, it's stuck in place and you drill through it. With 3D dynamic navigation uh, or a dynamic guide, 
it is turn by turn. And what's, what's nice about it is you don't have a piece that, that sits over the teeth. So what that means for the patient is they don't have to open up as wide. It also gives you more possibilities, especially if you're working in, in, the, in, in the posterior part of the mouth. Um, the hard part about it, though, is, of course, you have to buy another machine, which you may not want to do, but it does give you the benefit of, um, it does give you the benefit of doing surgeries like a sinus lift, like what we're doing here. Um, so we're, we're doing these sinus lifts, and we can actually drill and, and watch the tip of our drill approach the sinus floor. And that way, um, as we're doing this, you can see the hard part about it is that you're looking at a monitor instead of looking at the patient's mouth. But it's really nice if you're doing uh, implant surgery, you want to change your plan on the fly. You know, maybe you, know, you don't get to do that when you have a static surgical guide because the lab makes it and it's already done. In a situation like this, if you figure out that, hey, you know, my plan was terrible, you can modify it at that point, and it's, and it's no big deal because it's a dynamic guy. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm basically doing a, a, a transcrystal, you know, sinus graph. And what's neat about it is you can, you can have your plan that you can see on the left side of your screen, and then you can see on the right side of your screen, you know, with, with the uh, sinus graph in place with the implant uh, placed at the same time. So it's it's a nice way to, to utilize CBCT to perform your grafting procedures as well. Not that, that we're, we're gonna get into that today yet. So for my last uh, 10, 15 minutes, what I wanna do is walk you guys through a case from start to finish, because I want to answer the question for you, where do you start with all this information? Okay, so what do you want to do? So if you have a CBCT already, you know, hopefully you're at the very least, once again, you know how to show and tell, do a show and tell with it. You should be able to do a case presentation with it. You should be able to virtually place an implant with the software so you know if an implant is going to fit into their existing ridge, right? Um, maybe you want to get into surgical guides, maybe you don't, but it, I want to show you how I'm using it nowadays. And we have stopping points at, at every point uh, in my workflow to where, you know, sometimes I don't need to utilize the entire CBCT capability. Sometimes I, I want to look at it just to see if there is enough bone. Okay. And that's, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But there are other times like in the aesthetic zone, which I'm getting ready to show you where I want to use my CBCT to its full capacity to where I don't want to think or do any thinking at all. I just want to get this tooth replaced for my patient. So let's walk through that. So here we've got a case where we have tooth number seven. Okay, the tooth number seven is hopeless. Now under traditional exams, we would have you know, clinical photos, you'd have your probing depths and your perio charting, and then you'd have a periapical film. That's really all you would have, right? But there's a lot, like I showed you with, with uh, one of our single uh, repl tooth replacement cases of, a couple of cases ago, there's a lot that you can tell your patient with just a photo and a periapical film. Questions that I would have for me is, how is the overall health of the patient? I want to know, given the recession and the position of the teeth, that they're considering orthodontics if they want to address the receding gums. If they don't want to address the receding gums, I have to, to ask myself the question, is that a deal breaker for me to replace the tooth? And once again, that there's a lot of personal preference there. We want to talk about tooth replacement options. Are we talking about, uh, are we dead set on an implant or are we considering a bridge? If we're going to do an implant, do we stage that implant or do we do an immediate replacement? If we're going to stage it, what is the patient going to wear while they're healing uh, from, from the extraction and the socket graft and things like that? And finally, what techniques are going to be involved? Okay, Am I going to be doing a, just a basic socket graft? Am I going to use a membrane? Am I going to do a, a guided bone regeneration to augment the site? Uh, are we doing partial extraction therapy? So those are some techniques that we'd be considering. 
questions the patient's going to have is how much is all this going to cost? You know, it sounds like a lot. You know, how long is it going to take? How much is it going to hurt? How long can I expect one treatment to last versus another? They may also want to ask you, what's going to look the What's going to look better? Does an implant look better than a bridge or the other way around? What will I wear while all this is going on? That's really, really important for them. So going back to questions I have with just these two bits of information, how is the overall health of the patient? I would say overall, they're good. There's a recession on tooth number six, but overall it's good. And tooth number seven is hopeless because it's mobile. There's also a carious lesion on the mesial of number seven, which uh, we're going to be replacing anyway. Is ortho being considered? The patient says no. Is the recession going to be addressed? She says not right now. Okay, tooth replacement options. Number one, bridge versus implant versus a, a removable appliance versus no treatment, okay? Obviously, most patients in this position an RPD or no treatment is not an option, so that it's really between a bridge and an implant. Are we going to stage or do an immediate replacement? I don't know. You know, we need a CBCT because I need to know where the labial plate is. If it's stage, what type of provisional? Once again, I, I don't know. You know, I don't. I'm going to need a CBCT. What techniques are we going to use to get the tooth out? and address the bone situation. Well, I don't know what the bone situation is, so once again, I'm gonna need a CBCT. Now, what about the questions that the patient has? How much is all this gonna cost? I don't know, okay? Because we need a CBCT. Well, but I will say this, usually uh, it costs, uh, an implant costs more than a bridge, just generally speaking. But we also need to ask exactly what is cost? You know, Is there a difference between price versus cost? And I always like to explain to my patients that, you know, price is just how much money it, how, how much money is going to be exchanged, but cost to factors in other things like time of treatment, how much it hurts, uh, how long the treatment is going to last and that type of thing. Um, how much time we're going to need to, to completion, how much things are going to hurt. All these questions that they have are going to require a CBCT for us to be able to tell uh, her this. Um, cosmetics, you know, once again, we need a CBCT because not an implant doesn't always look better than a bridge. There are a, a lot of times where a bridge looks way better than an implant. So in order to, to figure out, you know, if the patient's going to leave that day with a tooth or if they're going to be wearing an Essex retainer or a flipper, we need a CBCT. So let's go ahead and, and we'll get that. What are some other things that we can tell that from this case, uh, just from the clinical impression? We know, you know, just like the other, the other patient, when a patient has long tapered teeth like this, they are a difficult aesthetic case because they have skinny pointy papilla that are going to be unstable. Okay, so we always look at tooth morphology. We also know that uh, at least on number six, we have a pretty thin biotype. We have a pretty thin biotype on number seven as well, which we're going to take out. So these all lead to, you know, to us thinking about the tissues being unstable. The adjacent teeth look pretty healthy. So you know, that brings into the point of, you know, do we really want to cut down perfectly healthy teeth to do a bridge? Um, what does that, does, uh, does a bridge also you know, prevent us from addressing the recession later on, on, on number six? Um, does it mess things up from a two pr pr proportion, you know, perspective? Um, the occlusion, we have to look at the occlusion as well, especially if we're talking about immediate provisionalization and things like that. So there's some things that we can think about that, that we can already see and ask ourselves clinically and we already know the answers to some of this. We know that cosmetically, it's a pretty challenging case because of the uh, tall scallop papilla, thinner biotype. What we do have going for us though, is that uh, number, number seven is more incisively positioned than number 10. So the papilla have, have come down with it a little bit more. So if we do lose the papilla a little bit, it won't be the end of the world. We can actually afford to do that a little. So that, that's a good thing for us.
This is her smile line. So we know she has a high smile line. She does have some gingival display above tooth number seven. So this is all stuff that we know just from looking at her smile, looking at her teeth uh, with her cheeks retracted, and then just looking at a peri periapical film. But now, in order to answer the rest of our questions, we're going to need, this is our question list earlier, we're gonna need a CVCT. So I'm just gonna show you one slice, which is the sagittal view. And from that, I love what I see, because in addition to all the other questions about cost and things that I can answer for the patient, my questions for myself can be answered. So she has a short root and it's really wide, uh, a very wide ridge apical to where uh, the root ends. So I love that because now I can think about uh, doing an immediate implant. With her occlusion, you know, with the tooth being just a little bit more incisively positioned in the uh, opposing lateral, I know that we can probably do a provisional at the same time. Um, we have a nice uh, facial plate, so I don't really think we need to do anything uh, like partial extraction therapy. Uh, she does have a thin biotype, so we'll probably add a little bit of a soft tissue graft whenever we take her, whenever we take her tooth out and put her implant in. So those are some questions that I can answer based on this one slice of a CBCT. Cost-wise, this is pretty easy too. I, I know that from a cost perspective, you know, I'm going to tell our office manager we're going to do a, an, ex, uh, an extraction. Uh, we're going to place an implant immediately. We're going to add a soft tissue graft, and we're going to have our lab make a provision. So those four things, done. Okay. Later on, the only thing that I have to do is provide my restorative dentist with an, uh, with an impression coping and a lab analog, and they're done. Okay. So that's a pretty straightforward plan based on this one slice of the CBCT. Time-wise, you know, the patient at this point doesn't care because she's going to leave, leave home with, leave my office with a tooth in place. Pain-wise, uh, also, yeah, mild to moderate pain. Uh, longevity, I feel good about telling her that an implant is going to last longer than a bridge. Um, and cosmetic-wise, uh, I believe our, we're going to be able to meet her cosmetic uh, demands and expectations based on what I can see uh, from this slice here. And what will I wear while all this is going on? It's just going to be an immediate provisionalization. So let's go ahead and, and get, to, get to work here. So when you go to surgery, what you're gonna do is you gotta choose a lab, right? So not, so just, I use Vulcan labs for my surgical guides and my immediate provisionalizations. So when you do that, all you have to do is you upload to the website a CBCT and digital impressions or um, or regular you know cast and uh, cast is, is models is fine. Um, I inquire about so whatever lab you choose, inquire about services like a temporary fabrication. Um, you're going to want to know if they use tie bases or if they use a temporary abutment or how they use what they use, just so you know. Uh, you'll also want to know if want to let them know if, or ask them if they uh, make, make custom healing abutments. Um, if you have any choice of materials like PNMA or whatever you want to use, okay? Um, after that, you set up a planning session with, with, the, uh, with the lab. They, I do all my planning sessions on Monday after work. So, and, and then I also like to ask if my planner is going to be a dentist or just a technician. That just kind of gives me a feel for who I'm going to be conversing with uh, during my appointment. At my planning session, um, you should have already submitted a prescription, meaning, uh, for example, I'm going to be doing an immediate implant placement, tooth number seven. I would like a BioHorizons implant somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.4 diameter and you know 12 millimeters long, okay? Just write something up to give them an, to give them a feel for what you're trying to do. Um, so you'll want to give them all that information. Then your planner, by the time you show up to your Zoom call, they they will already have kind of a rough tentative plan for you. And then all you have to do your surgical plan, you know, for a single tooth, mine take about five minutes because we've already talked about it. It's in my prescription. We look at it and they say it's good to go. So we just 
you know, sign off on it and, and they go to fabrication. I like to tell my patients it takes about two weeks for the, uh, for the surgical guide to be fabricated. So I don't schedule them for at least two weeks just in case we have some holdups in, in delivery. So now the tooth is out. Look at the papilla shrinkage. Like I said, <laughs> this is the beauty of looking at your cases before you even touch the patient. That way you can tell them what to expect. As soon as we took the tooth out, you can see the papilla are intact. I didn't do anything uh, surgically to these papilla, but they are going to shrink up. I'm gonna place my surgical guide. For me, I like to go completely guided, meaning I like to place my implant through the surgical guide. And if you're doing a, an immediate provisionalization, you really don't have a choice but to do completely guided. Uh, completely guided means that we're doing everything, including placing the implant through the surgical guide. Some people like to only have a pilot guide and that's fine, but I like to place my implant through the guide as well. So the implant is in place exactly where I want it. I'm going to grab my provisional from Vulcan and uh, I'm gonna test the stability of my implant before I screw on my provisional. I like to use uh, my Austel from BioHorizons. It's a resonance frequency analysis uh, machine. What it does is it tracks the stability. I don't wanna to go too deep into this, but I like to use it. Other people instead will use insertion torque and they, they'll say that if, as long as their insertion torque is at 35 newton centimeters or higher, then they're good to go. I like to use this machine because uh, I don't have to torque anything. You know, it's basically um, a machine that you just hold a wand over your implant and it reads, it shoots out a number, okay? If it's 70 and greater, it's high stability. If it's 60 to 69, it's medium stability. Anything less than that, we call it low stability. So in a situation like, let's just say you, sh you do your RFA and it's, and it's too low, what you end up doing is you just take your provisional and you chop off the top of it, and make it a custom, a custom impression, I, I'm sorry, a custom healing above. And then what you do is you just bond the adjacent tooth that you just took out, is bond it to the teeth for now. So that's, that, that's my plan B. But in a situation like this, where I'm drilling into mostly native bone because that root was so short, I'm actually going to screw that, in, that uh, provisional in, into place immediately. And then I'm gonna use a little piece of alloderm as my soft tissue graft because once again, I'm still trying not to hurt the patient if I don't have to. And we're going to place uh, the provisional. And then, like I said, I just fill in my access hole with just some uh, compression material. And that's what she's gonna look like for a little bit until we make her final impression. Now, last tip I have for you, communicating with your restorative dentist or even communicating with yourself because you have to capture the soft tissue. Now, what you're gonna do is you're gonna put a lab analog into some stone, okay? Some people use a dappin dish, I use this medicine cup, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna unscrew your provisional restoration. Okay, and you're going to screw it onto the analog in the stone. You're going to take an impression of the of the uh, cervical portion of the provisional, and then you're going to unscrew the provisional. So now you have an, an impression of the cervical portion of your uh, provisional restoration uh, in the stone here. Okay, now you're going to take a regular impression coping, and you're going to screw it on top of the analog and you're going to uh, you know, fill that up uh, halfway with uh, just some flowable composite. So it's gonna look something like this. And then I'll mark, uh, which is with a pencil, I'll just put F for facial, that way I know which side faces the facial. And then we'll screw it into place and, and take an impression. Okay, that's how you capture the soft tissue accurately. Because if you don't do this, as soon as you take the impression off, uh, the, uh, the um, provisional off and put your impression coping on, if it's not a custom one, the gum tissue will shriek in um, too, too rapidly. So this captures the, the gingival architecture perfectly. And then here's your final restoration. I'm gonna be about one minute over time, but um, you evaluate it on the CBCT once again, so that you know that your implants are dead center of the ridge. 
and there's your final result. So bottom line, you know, CBCT in action all depends on where you want to go. It's all up to you. You can do everything from show and tell all the way to fully guided uh, implant surgery with your final restorations. Even if, if you want to, I just showed you a provisional, but uh, the sky is the limit. But the first thing you got to do is at least learn how to operate a CBCT and learn its capabilities. So with that, um, I want to leave you with a quote from Woodrow Wilson. I not only use all of the brains that I have, but all that I can borrow. And I do this a lot because I don't, I'm not smart enough to, to discover anything. So I'm always asking my friends what to do. Um, if you guys are interested in any hard or soft tissue rafting, you know, uh, you guys probably know my friend, Dr. Curry Levitt. We're doing a hard tissue course with, with some basic soft tissue management at his facility in Las Vegas, March 4th and 5th, 2022. Uh, 1500 bucks. It's a two day course, got hands on and a live surgical demonstration. Uh, you guys will love it if you like, if you like this. Um, with that being said, um, let's leave the floor open to questions. All right, let's do it. Um, what software do you use for your surgical guides? Uh, my software that I use for my surgical guides, I actually use two different ones. I either use um, uh, Anatomage, but my favorite one is, is just the one that comes up with Plan Mecca, and for whatever reason, it's it's <laughs> left me uh, what that is. But I, I anything anything works really well. Actually, sometimes I don't, it's out of my control because I work with so many other res restorative dentists. Um, but um, I, I just use the Plan Mecca software whenever I have it because that's what my machine is. All right. Uh, what was the name of the article in the beginning that you mentioned on CBCT? Uh, name of the article in the beginning. I'll sh am I still sharing my screen? I don't know. I'll just yes. pop it yep. up. It is right there. All right. Um, how did you superimpose the wax up onto the CBCT? Yeah, so that's actually really cool. So uh, you can do it on your end of it. If you want to, it's every software is a little bit different, but honestly, the easiest way to do it is whenever you make your planning appointment with somebody like Vulcan or whoever you decide to use, they can do it for you. Uh, so they, they can even do it for you so you don't have to mess with it. All right. There is a question here asking how much a CBCT costs. I don't know if you want to spitball with, with what you know, but I will say feel free to reach out to Henry Shine. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know anymore because I've actually had my Plan Mecca Pro Max for uh, since 2005. So I've had it for 16 years. I don't know how much they cost anymore. All right. Uh, how do you convert um, a tooth into a temporary? So when you convert a tooth into a temporary, so there's two different ways. Sometimes it's going to be, um, there, there's two different ways. So if you have like a natural tooth, which is rare for me, usually it's a crown. But if it's a crown, all you do is just cut the tooth out of it, and then you're left with, with your crown. So then you just cut a hole in the cingulum, and there's your temporary. If it's a natural tooth, you can actually do the same thing. You just have to be a little bit more careful when you hollow it out because you, you got to be careful not to break it. Um, another thing that you can do is you can actually take a, a miniature impression just of the tooth that you're taking out and the adjacent teeth. Just take an impression of it, and then just – just um, pour up a, you know, you just just put some composite in it, and and that's how, that's your temporary. All right. On the case with the tuberosity graft, where you grafted into the delayed placement, what did you use for the provisional? Uh, so in that in that situation there, that patient actually just had an Essex retainer. Yeah. So. One of the things that, that was in my workflow that I didn't really get to touch on too much is that's part of my consultation is when a, whenever a patient is involved with a bunch of grafting, you know, hard or, and or soft tissue grafting, I, I try to mentally prepare them that they're going to have to wear something removable for a while. And that's something removable. I usually prefer an Essex retainer because it's more tooth borne, so I don't have to worry about anything smashing, you know, the grafting. Um, on occasion, they'll wear a flipper, but I'd say most of the time, I prefer they, they use an Essex retainer. Uh, thoughts on BioHorizon for immediate placement? 
Love it. That's all I use for immediate placement. Taper Pro implant, nice aggressive thread, uh, great implant design, super duper easy to use. Um, as far as the kit is involved, whenever you get into the surgical guide, it's even easier. Um, as you as you can see, I'm placing the implant through the guide. One common question always is, how do you know when to stop? Well, that's part of your surgical guide with Vulcan. They they have a stopper that tells you literally where to stop your drill to to know that your implant's deep enough. And they have a dot on your on your guide and a dot on your drill. And as soon as the two dots line up, that's when you're done and your provisional is gonna slip right on. Like it does not get any easier than a, than a BioHorizons Taper Pro implant. How long have you been using the X guide and what situations do you prefer to use it versus a static guide or a brain guide? Yep, so X guide is wonderful. Um, in sit, I, I, so first off, I've had mine uh, for three years, I believe. I believe I got it in 2018. I, I could be lying, but I, I believe I got it the very first year that they that they came out. Uh, so it could have been 2017. I can't remember, but it's been a few years. So remember on my chart, you know, I was talking about the experience level and, and different ways to use CBCT. With X guide, I got to be honest with you, I stop after the surgical plan. I don't do anything beyond that. Now, that's my own limitation it's because i've chosen not to use all the other stuff uh, you can do a lot with x guide and dynamic guides i've chosen to just only use it for surgical treatment planning and the reason that is because i don't have the patience personally to, to draw up the prosthetics and guess how big the tooth is and all that other stuff because those little things a millimeter here and there you can really wreck your surgical guide when you when you um, aren't aren't familiar with with doing that yourself which i'm not so I literally use it to look at the bone and stick the implant in and I'm done. I don't, I, and I use it mostly uh, in areas where in the, in the posterior part of the mandible where the patient is, I, you know, like, like they may have had a lot of vertical atrophy and I can't really see very well. So I use it a lot in those types of situations. I never use them in the front. I just, the workflow I showed you is what I use for all front teeth. What would be the protocol and timeline in the number seven case if you had to do delayed placement? Super easy. That's a, that's an easy one too, especially in our area. So in a situation like that, you know, the first, the biggest thing for patients is they want to know what they're going to wear. So since number seven was a natural tooth, you know, if they want something fixed, then we either go with the Maryland bridge or we just bond the tooth to the adjacent teeth since it's a natural tooth. Uh, if they want something removable, like I said, I'll go with an Essex retainer. But as far as the timing goes, you take out the tooth, you put, you put your bone graft in with the membrane or not, just depending on what your style of, of uh, socket grafting is. Um, I, I usually take another CAT scan at, at 12 weeks and then make a guide from there and go. All right, got a couple left here. Uh, do you get primary closure when you do site preservation? Uh, site preservation, I don't usually, not in a basic socket graft. Um, of course, there are situations where, you know, you're socket grafting, but you, you're having to rebuild a wall. In that situation, then I do get primary closure. But if I already have a facial wall, then I don't. Uh, is there any scatter from Planmeca CBCT? Now uh, there is going to be scatter. So anytime you have a patient with a lot of with a lot of dental work, uh, there is potential for scatter. If you're seeing a lot of scatter on your on your images, then all it is is just a simple machine setting. All you do is just call their customer service or whoever your trainer is, and they can modify those settings to minimize the scatter for you. Oh, pretty good. I just had one. Um, what's your quick criteria to soft and bone graft for immediate placement in the anterior region? Yeah, so I like the technique that I showed you all. Uh, I'll put, uh, you know, I'll put the implant in, and then I'll put a, I'll use Mineros, you know, particulate bone graft around the implant, and then I'll just, if I'm using a provisional like I showed you, I'll get a piece of alloderm, and I'll just fit it over there, over the, uh, over the. Uh, 
the threads of the abutment screw that's attached to my uh, provisional, and then I'll just screw it in. And that that uh, poncho technique is what they call it. Um, that covers the top of the of the socket site and augments the facial tissue as well. That's my favorite. Um, I'll use PRF on occasion. I'll use connective tissue on occasion, but my favorite is just doing what I showed you with the alloderm. In order to reserve the papillas, would a mattress suture help in that case? You know, mat vertical mattress is, is probably what is what you're going to want to do in a situation like that. Uh, you don't want to go too crazy though, because you know, keep in mind when you're putting sutures through um, things like papilla, you know, sutures. You know, that's kind of a micro incision, honestly, with your needle. Um, so that harms the tissue as well. So I would say the majority of the time I'll do no sutures. I like, I like to use my provisional to support the papilla as much as I can. Um, if there is no buckle plate, when you do a bone graft, do you need a large flap? Did I read that right? Uh, yeah, everybody's a little bit different. So on your, when you use your CBCT, you'll, you should be able to identify with, because every, your CBCT slices are at one millimeter. So you'll be able to figure out, you know, how wide, how wide your uh, dehiscence is. So depending on how wide the dehiscence is, you'll have to design your, your flap accordingly, um, which that topic is great. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to like self promote or anything, but that is, that is the number one topic that we go over um, in our course with Dr. Dr. Levin and I, uh, when we team up with, with BioHorizons and the OR Foundation. All right, we've got three questions left. Um, so you said no primary closure on certain cases. What do you like as the membrane? Yeah, so for situations like this where we're doing immediate implants or just socket grafts, I like a rigid membrane, so something like Memlock. So a rigid, resorbable collagen membrane. So the key thing there is rigid, Second key thing is resorbable. So I'm not trying to push any brands on people, but but I, you know, a good one's always Memlock. It's just, it's just perfect uh, as far as rigidity and resor resorption rates great. And of course it doesn't cost that much either. All right, we're gonna knock two questions out here. Number one, what suture do you use for anterior teeth? And then the follow-up, what type of sutures and size? Yeah, um, sutures, I up until last month, uh, I was using, uh, 5 0 Vicryl, and now I'm actually using a 5 0 polypropylene. I'm mixing some of that in there as well. Uh, polypropylene is nice because you know it's it's not braided, so it doesn't wick any bacteria. Also, easy to remove. Downside, it's bright blue, so sometimes patients don't like that. Uh, I like Vicryl. Uh, like I said, that's what I used for almost 19 years. Um, love it. Just really, it's gotten very, very expensive. And I hate to make this about money, but man, it's, it literally is like four or five times more expensive than anything else. So I've, I've uh, made a change. All right, there you uh, have it. But, but cool. five, oh, five, oh, guys. Cool. If anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to email us, webinars at henryshine.com, or you can uh, definitely reach out to Dr. Wong via his Instagram handles. We did record today's webinar, so everyone will receive that in the next week or so. Dr. Wong, thanks as always. Uh, don't Are you lined up for any more this year, or is it next year? Um, man, actually, I think I'm next year now. All right. Well, we've used you enough this year. So yes, yeah. I think we did six. I think we did like six, five or yes, six. Did. Did. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. always a pleasure. Great stuff as always. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a great night. Thank you, guys. We'll see you later. Thank you.